So let's talk about the Battle of Hastings. This battle in 1066 resulted in the Norman conquest of England, in part because all of the Saxon leaders were killed at the battle. We don't know much about the battle. In fact, all of our sources were written decades after the battle occurred. And so even 90 or 100 years ago, the historical estimates of the number of participants were about 25,000 aside. And nowadays, the estimates are more like six or seven or 8,000 aside. We think we know where the battle took place. The Normans built an abbey, which is called Battle Abbey, on the hill or ridge where the battle supposedly took place. But they did this decades after the battle. And there's some doubt about whether the battle actually took place there because the ground doesn't yield up bits of bone and weapons and so forth, whereas another site not far away does. And typically, battlefields of this sort yield those things up even today, a thousand years almost after the occurrence. This doesn't really matter. Um, it's an advantage to a game designer that we don't know much about the game or about the battle because we can make the game the way we want. But I found even with those few constraints that I had to fudge the game a little to make it more interesting as a game and less as an exercise in playing out the battle. That's because medieval and ancient battles were not only very chancy, but the commander had very little control over what happened once the battle started. Now, Alexander the Great overcame that because his most powerful unit, his heavy cavalry, followed him and he led from the front. But typically, forces line up, they start to fight. There's no command and control to speak of. There's no hierarchy of leadership other than, okay, Harold, you're in the center and your brother's on one wing and your other brother's on the other wing. There's no way to communicate particularly except runners. And so the battle sort of occurred on its own. And for example, at Hastings, a couple of times we think, we don't know. William the Bastard's horse was killed under him and he went down and his troops said, oh, he's dead, he's dead. And when that happens in an old battle like that, often the troops will break, especially if they're not say, early Roman Empire style professional troops. But he found another horse, got back on, and the battle continued. And again, we don't know that occurred. We think it occurred, just as we don't know how Harold, the Saxon, was killed. There's speculation he was hit by an arrow. Maybe that killed him, maybe not. Maybe he didn't get hit by the arrow. I think your average modern has no idea how little we know about these kinds of battles. So we know that the Saxons and Normans lined up, the Saxons defended the hill, the Normans attacked, and the Normans prevailed. Now, how did I get on this idea of doing this battle? Well, my wife, who's English, and I were visiting the Battle Abbey, and in the National Trust shop, there was a little box, maybe two and a half by three inches, that had a game in it. And through cellophane, you could see two metal figures. Well, I was too cheap to buy the game to find out what it was like. But I said to myself, I should be able to make a little game like that of the whole battle. And perhaps the National Trust shops all over Britain at all the national parks in effect of Britain would be willing to market it. Well, it turned out in the end that my game is a little too complicated for that, but that's the origins of it. Now, if you want to make a simple game, you make a card game. You could possibly make an abstract board game, but a board game that's supposed to represent something, a model, it's difficult to make it really, really simple. So I said, I'm going to make a card game. Also, board games are really hard to fit into a small box. Now, there was a time in the 70s and 80s when something called micro games were quite popular. And those were board games that did fit into fairly small boxes because everything was made very small. 
and very cheap, thin cardboard and so on. And those games sold for 10 or $15. But you can't do that kind of thing anymore. Among other things, 10 or $15 in contemporary terms are somewhere around $30, $40, $50. And second, people don't want that kind of cheap little stuff. So my game, Dragon Rage, which was a micro game, sold for $10. It sold 10,000 copies. And then the company went bust for reasons that had nothing to do with the board games. The, the parent company was a miniatures company. Nowadays, you're not going to sell 10,000 copies, even of a small, cheap game, because there are so many, many games being published. So, cards are easier to produce cheaply than any kind of board and cardboard units or blocks or whatever you want to use as units. So I decided I would use cards to represent the units. But then I didn't have a board. And if you want to represent warfare, you must have a field for maneuver. Warfare is about slaughter and maneuver. And if you don't have a board, you can't have maneuver, practically speaking. You've got to have geospatial relationships between the entities that are in the combat. So how, is going to, how was I going to do this with cards? And other people have done the same thing. You use the cards as the board as well. There are two strips at the sides to help arrange the six columns and seven rows of cards. And at the start of the battle, six of those rows are filled with cards. As the battle goes on, cards are eliminated, units are eliminated, but you can always put dead units face down in places to, as a, a holder or space holder if things get confused. So the cards served as both the units and the board. I, that's not something that's unknown, but it is pretty uncommon. Because battles are quite chancy, I wanted to use dice in the resolution of the combat, but I didn't want to have a dice table. Dice tables are very much not something you want to have people have to deal with if you're selling a game in a national trust shop, but nowadays you just don't want combat tables, period. Many people just will not deal with any kind of lookup table in a game. Well, I adopted a combat method that I had devised for Valley of the Four Winds around 1980, and that worked very, very well in the game. Then what I wanted to do in the game was highlight the most important aspects of the battle. So I wanted the Normans to have archers and the Saxons not have archers. I didn't want the archers to have a, a very strong effect because they did not at that time. The bows that they used were very weak. They did not have crossbows and they did not have English style longbows. They didn't have probably even composite bows. They just had weak bows. I wanted the Norman cavalry to make some difference. Not a lot, because a lot of this battle is on terrain that goes up or down. It's not flat. I wanted the leaders to be very important, because the battle was essentially about the two leaders. And in the game, you can put your leader at risk, because he, he leads and he helps your units, but if he's killed, then that makes it tough on you. You can win the game if your leader has been killed, but it's hard. And of course, neither leader can be killed or both leaders can be killed. Keep in mind, I was doing this a long time ago. I finished the game and placed it with the publisher. And the last time I play tested it was 2009. The publisher had it for all those years in between saying that they were going to adapt it to a series of games, and finally they disappeared on me. I sent it to Worthington. They really liked it, and in a short time, it's on their pre-order system. You never know how people are going to react. So I was able to do things in that game, perhaps, that many more modern gamers who tend to be like party gamers would not cope with. Nonetheless, fortunately, I did avoid any kind of unit stacking, and I did avoid any kind of tables. Now, I fought the game out 
a number of times and found it was very dull because it was too much like the real thing. That is to say, I was in control of my units because inevitably in a war game, you're moving the units. So I had a lot more control over my units than an actual general would. Nonetheless, it was very crowded and there wasn't much opportunity for a maneuver. So I changed the game and made more opportunity for maneuver than was actually true of battles at that time. So it became a more interesting game, but a little bit less a representation than otherwise I might have made. But my personal philosophy is that the game is more important than the model or the representation. And so that's what I went with. So we have a game with one deck of cards, a couple of pieces for William and Harold, a couple of markers for temporary damage done by archery. Some of the cards are option cards that can affect how the game is played. Uh, 40 of the cards are unit cards. And you have a couple of strips to help mark the sides of the board. And that's it. And that's why it's a relatively inexpensive game. And that's also why, it being a simple game, you can play it in 30 minutes or 60 minutes, depending on what sort of player you are. As it happens, in the interim between 2009 and now, shorter games have become much more popular and longer games much less popular than in the past. You, if you're a war gamer, might not have noticed that, but it's very, very noticeable. I remember going to a Game Designers Guild meeting a couple of years ago and said I had a filler game that was maybe an hour or 45 minutes. And he looked at me and said, no, Lou, that's not a filler game anymore. Filler games are 15, 20 minutes. That's how things are going. So the game fits with contemporary points of view purely by accident. And sometimes that's how things go. So I've gone on long enough. I hope you'll try the game. Thanks for listening.